Brethren, it's good to know that we serve a good God. We know that he's good because of what we have heard, what we've here declared. When men hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ, now I'm not talking about watered down stuff, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, when that's heard, men come to know the living God who has given his son as a sacrifice for the sins of all humanity and commands all men everywhere to repent. Now today it may seem as that God is not known among professing believers, but of course this is due to a flawed message that has no origin with the Holy Scriptures. You remove God's revelation of himself from the pulpit, then you remove the means to know him. This is why our main theme is so precise in how it is stated. The attributes and work of God declared in the gospel. These are things that are only found through subjection to the gospel of Christ. You preach any other message, you will distort the name of the Lord and misrepresent him. I am glad this is not the case in these gatherings, these rich times of gospel exposition. I'm glad I'm not coming to a dry and thirsty land, scrounging, trying to find something good, something I can live on for the next minute. But also, I'm glad that I'm not speaking to a crowd that is not thirsty. Doesn't this fit? Isn't the picture so fitting? Refreshing water. Some people are content with what the rich man asked for. Send down a drop, Lazarus. Is this the refreshing drops renewal? Well, actually, you know what he said? He said, just dip your finger in it and just touch it to my tongue. Because this heat, this, this heat is tormenting me. Well, this is not a tongue cooling service. It is not. This is a place where those who hunger and thirst are filled. The Lord promised. He said those who hunger and thirst after righteousness would be filled. He promised that. And we believe that promise. And I am confident and fully persuaded that you are such a people. You've come hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And with that being said, I desire to be a vessel by which this promise can be carried out. I desire this message to fill you. My message this evening is the wisdom, or this afternoon I should say, evening, whatever you want to call it. This message is about the wisdom of God. I have two passages. I'll go ahead and read these for you really quick. First one will be in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to start at verse 23, read through 24. It says, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The next one will be in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 saying to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. This is something known about God through the gospel record. After being subjected to the gospel, that should be one of the, this should be one of your conclusions. God is wise. That's, I mean, that's, that should be in the mind of people who hear the gospel. God is wise. God is wise. We preach Christ, who is the wisdom of God, and we, as the church, are a means by which the wisdom of God is demonstrated to princi spiritual principalities and powers who are observing how the Lord is carrying out the salvation of the human race, which have fallen due to the transgression of Adam. But before we get into these key passages, we should at least have an understanding of what wisdom is and then understand the kind of wisdom that God has. Now, mainly when you hear the word wisdom or someone being wise, you may think words like smart or intelligent. So when you hear someone is wise, you may say of that person, that person's really smart. Well, don't get me wrong. You do have to be intelligent in order to be wise, but that's not mainly what wisdom is referring to. If you want a literal mean, the word literally does mean to know, but wisdom does not simply refer to the possession of knowledge alone. Here's something, here's a meaning Webster gave to the word meaning many years ago. Webster says the meaning, this is the meaning of wisdom in his dictionary. The right use or exercise of knowledge. The choice of laudable ends and of the best means to accomplish them. This is wisdom in act, effect, or practice. If wisdom is to be considered the faculty of the mind, it is the faculty of discerning or judging what is the most just, proper, and useful. And if it is to be considered as an inquirement, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conducive to prosperity or happiness. Now, you will not read that in today's dictionaries, but that is a very good meaning to the word. We can gather from this that God certainly does exercise his knowledge, and he's doing it in salvation. 
God does not just need to just tell us that he's wise. He, we can see it for ourselves by looking what he has done. Wisdom is use of knowledge, but to be specific, it's correct use of knowledge. It is arriving at the right conclusions, making the most just judgments, and carrying out one's will by the most proper and effective means possible. With this being said, it should be known that God makes no mistakes. God does not have to repeat the process due to error. God does not make an unjust judgment. His means of completing his work are not ineffective. God is wise in the highest sense possible. That may seem obvious to those of us who are called, but this view of God has become very sparse in our time. You see, men in our time, like the Grecians of old, have made the error of viewing God as being a man. The Greeks of old, when they made up their tyrannical, lascivious, adulterous, and empty-headed gods, made their gods like themselves. Why were their gods lascivious? Because they were. Why were they barbaric? Because they were. Their gods even looked like men. You see, a statue of Zeus looks just like a human being, just like you and me. Full head of hair, facial hair, eyes, nose, lips. It's a man. They even acted like men and reasoned like men. But today, men speak of God as if he was one of them. You know how people say things like, well, to err is human. And nobody's perfect, and well, you know, we're only human. Well, men seem to speak of God this way, too. They question his ways as if he was inconsistent. They argue about things that he does as if he did something unjust. You just gather this the way that people talk about God today. For example, how many times have you heard the question, how could a loving God do something like that? Very popular question. They even have books written on this in Christian bookstore. How could a loving God dot, 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 haven't read a word of it. This question presumes God has acted out of character. But I will tell you right now, men are not at liberty in any way to put God on trial and act as a judge over him. Amen. To such an idea, I respond, who are you, old man, that replies back to God? Good question to ask yourself when in that position or faced with that kind of thing. Who are you? Isn't that what God asked Job to? He's like, sit back and let me ask you a few questions. Where were you when this happened and this happened? Job put his hand over his mouth. I spoke things, uh, things I didn't understand. If only more people could do that. Have this same kind of spirit about them, the spirit of humility that men had even before scripture was written. But at this point, I want to show you that God's wisdom is not like that of man. As men may assume, when you hear that God is wise, don't think wisdom of the world. Like we have wisdom and God has wisdom. God just has more of it. Not so. God's wisdom is not like the wisdom of this world. God has made it known, 1 Corinthians 3, 19, that God, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with him. 1 Corinthians 1, 20, it says God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. On top of these main passages, take these ones I'll read to you in consideration, highlighting some main things. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 8, it says, and my speech and my preaching was, listen up now, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith, listen up again, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Listen up again, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world. Here's the thing, that come to naught. Their wisdom comes to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, listen again, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Now that sounds like wisdom of a different order. When he said, Man's wisdom and God's wisdom is not the same or harmonious. Man's wisdom is useless when it comes to the message. This requires God's wisdom. Let's go down to 1 Corinthians 2.13. It says, which things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And a final one here in 2 Corinthians 1.12. It says, for our rejoicing is, our rejoicing is in this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, 
not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. This should make it plain that worldly wisdom is never credited to the Lord. So if you do see something foolishly done, that's not something that comes from God. Foolishness doesn't have origin with God. God is not foolish. God is no fool. Any wisdom that man does have was obtained and learned. And even a lot of the so-called wisdom isn't very impressive. God didn't obtain his wisdom. He didn't learn the knowledge that he has. He's the eternal God and the knowledge was already there. Man's wisdom is nothing more than a corruption of the knowledge of God, which is what men do. They corrupt things. Men today, you know, smart man who's come such a long way since the days of old, learned so much more about things, still can't figure out where the world came from. They argue about this. They still don't know how old the world is. They don't know where the creatures that inhabit the world came from. They don't. They have ideas, but they can't give you a solid answer, just an idea. Year after year, men have a new idea of how this happened and how that happened. When all along we had the Lord right here who has known everything all along from the very beginning. It's a foolish pursuit. God's already made known these things to us. And men try to achieve that knowledge by another means. And they go in circles. Let us do away with foolish notions that man, in his wisdom, can surpass the wisdom of our God. Now, James described the wisdom of the world, this is in James 3.15, he described the wisdom of the world as not from above. Earthly, sensual, and devilish. However, later in verse 17 of that same chapter, James refers to the wisdom that I'm speaking about, the wisdom of God, which he says is from above. Wisdom that is from above. That's a key thing to remember. When you read walk in wisdom, remember, that's talking about walk in wisdom that's from above. When you read, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Remember, that's, if any man lack wisdom from above. You don't want to ask for more wisdom that God says is foolish. Ask for wisdom from above. Now, at this point, I'm going to be speaking about the work of salvation, like how it started and the means by which God's bringing it to pass. But when, and when you consider what God wants to do, you'll see that it is indeed a work that requires a great amount of wisdom. Wisdom that only God has. But first I want to make known that God has an audience who's watching his work. According to the Ephesians text, principalities and powers in heavenly places are watching and learning about the work and nature of God. Principalities refers to those who are at the top, so to speak. They're leaders, the highest rank, rulers and governors. Like the word prince, that word means rulers in there. It makes it evident it's not referring to like some lowly servants that are of little significance. These are heavenly personalities who have charge and rule over other celestial beings. Michael was one of these. If you want an example, Michael was a principality. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. He had charge over a body, over an army, you could say. Powers refers to those who have like the most power. It's not talking like the bottom. Powers refers like the strongest of the group, so to speak. Like you could say those who have jurisdiction, those who have the final say. Like a judge, like when he says this is how it's going to be, that's it. Like if you go to like a courthouse or something like that, that's a power, like in this sense. Peter in his first epistle made known that the gospel was something angels desired to look into. That's in 1 Peter 1.12. And I know this is like not just certainly just Principalities and powers, I mean just angels in general. It's talking like a particular position, but everyone up there is wanting to see what's going on. So we have many watching the work of the Lord. The thing we see here is that God is showing things about himself that were not previously known about himself in heaven or in earth. But he's making these things known in salvation. God wants to be known. God doesn't want people to be ignorant of who he is. He wants people to know him. And he wants principalities and powers in heavenly places to know him as well. The things God wants known about himself are not going to be merely taught. Rather, they're going to be demonstrated and seen in his work. And in the case of my passages, God is going to show these principalities and powers his wisdom in salvation. So we'll look at what has happened, how God works this out. Now to start, like, go back to the beginning, so to speak. God created the world and all the creatures in it, and then he says he's going to make a creation in his own image. 
and form it from the dust of the earth. God forms man and breathes into his nostrils and makes him a living soul. God creates a woman for man as a help meet for him and then commands them as well as all the creatures to be fruitful and multiply. He has them live in a beautiful garden and tells them they can eat of all the trees in the garden except for one. One tree, that being the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Seemed like a simple enough task. Just one tree, right? It was not as if God had given him only one tree to eat from. There were plenty of other trees to go to. So with all these other trees around, surely Adam and Eve will easily ignore this one tree that's said to be their death if they eat from it. However, as simple as that may sound, through deception, the serpent managed to get Eve to eat the fruit and give it to her husband as well, who also ate it. Through this act of disobedience, man fell and became sinful. Sin entered the world. Because of this act of sin, God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, allowing them to enter no more. Harmony between man and God had been broken because of sin. Adam and Eve have two sons. One kills the other. Cain didn't eat the forbidden fruit, did he? This shows that this rebellious nature, it's passed on. It's going on to all the offspring now. Everyone's become just like you, Adam. Sinful. Because of Adam, all men are by nature sinful and rebellious toward the Lord. So what's God going to do here, though? If man is going to have fellowship with God, something needs to happen. They can't have fellowship with him like this. Sinful, cast away, rebellious. God is showing that he made a creature that couldn't live on its own and needed his assistance to live. However, this will be shown to be all the more true as the work progresses. Eventually, the world does get populated. People cover the earth. But the men become so violent and wicked in their actions, violence covers the earth, it says, and God was sorry he even made man, determined to wipe them out by means of a global flood. Time to cleanse the earth. But will this fix the issue, though? Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and God gave him instructions to build an ark to save him and his family, eight all together. Perhaps if God gets rid of everyone and starts over with a man that found grace in his eyes, that everything will go back to the way that it was. The flood wipes out the human race, and Noah survives with his family and the animals God had had him take into the ark with him. But has this issue of sin been fixed? Not so. It is not long before transgression spreads throughout the world again, after the flood takes place. This is why it's so silly for sinful men to argue that God is not good because of the presence of evil and harmful men. Why doesn't God get rid of all these serial killers and home invaders and terrorists, they ask foolishly. Not only, first of all, with that mindset, you have to forget the mercy God showed you. You were worthy of death too. But then again, with that kind of mindset, have you even read the account of the flood? He did. He did do that. It didn't work. It didn't solve the problem. There was a time where there was murders and all kinds of violent men all over the earth, and God just took them all away. But now here they all are back again. Does this mean that God's plan failed? Not so, brethren. In this, God demonstrates the seriousness of the issue. The sin that had spread throughout the human race was so severe that God could wipe out the whole human race except one family, and sin would still abound in the earth. How's that for showing how great, the, how serious of an issue you have on your hands? Now, mind you, God wants to save mankind from sin. This is why humanity was not completely annihilated here. God did preserve the race. He didn't eliminate and just start over. There was a bloodline continued. Amen. God showed, showed us that starting over didn't change the nature of man. But then again, some might think, like, why didn't he just blow up the planet and just start over? If it is so wicked, if it, mankind is such a wreck, a broken mess, why not just, you know, like you've seen these like in the sci-fi shows or whatever, like an asteroid hits the earth and just wipes everything out. Why didn't God just like, you know, just pop an asteroid down there and just wipe out everybody and just start from scratch again and make something more to his liking? Well, the problem with that is it would mean God had failed. Celestial beings would conclude and see that and say, he couldn't save this, he couldn't save this race. You see that kind of similar when Moses brought... When God said he would stamp out Israel and start a new nation through Moses, God said, well, what would the heathens say? 
They say he brought them out of Egypt, but he couldn't save them. Well, see, God has this mindset. God knows he's not going to give himself, he's not going to bring reproach to his name. God's not going to contradict himself. But so now, what is, now what's he going to do? That didn't fix the problem. It wasn't intended to fix the problem. But what's he going to do next? God's going to make, take a nation to himself and make them stand out from the rest of the world. Israel's what I'm talking about. They're not going to eat the same. They're not going to talk the same. They're not going to dress the same, act the same. They're not even going to cut their hair the same way. They're going to be different in all respects. This nation will be known as the people of God, and he's going to give these people a law as a means to be accepted in his sight. He's going to give them an advantage. God gives, Israel, gives the law to Israel and tells them if they do all the commandments of this law that he gives, then they're going to live. Do all the commandments, and they, 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 they resolve to do. That's all the commandments of the law we will do. They consented to give this their all. They're going to, they're going to really try at this. They're going to seek to attain this. And of course, if there are any out there who think righteousness and acceptance in the eyes of God can be achieved by human effort alone, then by all means, we ask you to demonstrate it by keeping the law. Go ahead. Give it a try. That's what the law is designed to do. Some would think that the law is simple, perhaps thinking that, you know, if you went a day without breaking one of the commandments, then you would have achieved the prize. Well, brethren, this is not how the law worked. You had to keep every single commandment of the law and never Break a single one as long as you were under it at any time. And if you do break one single commandment, you're guilty of the whole law. Now, when you look at it that way, it doesn't sound so easy, does it? Well, did they do it? Was Israel able to obtain righteousness through a system of rules and conduct? They did not. Though the law, through the law, it was shown that no amount of rules, regulations, actions, and motions could change a sinful man's heart of stone. Let's again be clear. Does this mean God had failed? Not so, brethren. Through the law, God again showed the greatness of the issue that needed dealing with. Through the law, God showed that man was helpless to change himself. Of course, if you think that I'm wrong about this, then, like I said, prove me wrong. Keep the law. You got the law right here. Find it in multiple translations if you seek it. Keep the law and show us that righteousness can be attained apart from Christ. Now, it's one thing for principalities and powers in heavenly places to understand man can't change himself. But God, in his wisdom, has set up a means for men to see that for themselves. Even man will acknowledge their own helplessness. Men don't have to be oblivious or ignorant of their own condition. God set up a means for men to know they are sinners, know they are helpless. The law is said to be the knowledge of sin. Through it, men learn they're helpless and in need of a savior. Someone else needs to step in and... Do something. God, in this case, is continuing to show the principalities and powers that he, what he is working with. He is showing them that if man is going to be accepted by him, then he needs to do something. God is removing any thinking that this could be accomplished by any other means other than him. Do you not see the wisdom of God in that? Before God saves men, he demonstrates that he is the only one that can help them. That had to be demonstrated. He wiped out the wicked generation of Noah's time and started over with a man of faith, but man was unable to recover. God made a nation live separate from the rest of the world and unto himself, sheltered in the strongest sense. But yet, they were still sinful. God gave this nation a law as a means to righteousness, but yet they were unable to fulfill the commandments. Now the conclusion is obvious. God is our only hope of being saved. But how is he going to save men? Here's the complication that God has to work with now. You see, God's righteous and God, even though he desires to save men, cannot let the sin issue go. We know these popular passages, God would have all men to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. Good passages to recite. Yet he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he'd rather that the wicked turn from the wicked ways and live. That's God's Amen. preference. Amen. But at the same time, he can't acquit the guilty. He won't. He won't acquit the guilty. God is a righteous judge, and to save men by waving off their sins as if they never happened, without dealing with them, would be unjust on his part and out of character. God has to do something about that sin. In order for God to, but in order for God to deal with man's sin directly, like with us directly, he has to destroy them. There has to be a punishment. So how is God going to save men and deal with their sins at the same time? 
Sounds like quite a dilemma. Sounds like something impossible. But brethren, the wisdom of God is shown in its greatness once more because he worked out salvation for mankind in what men would consider an impossible situation. All things are possible with God, brethren. But how did he work it out, though? He, he has a Savior prepared to bear humanity's sins, that being Jesus Christ. God's chosen his Son, Jesus Christ, as a means of saving humanity before the world was even created, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now, right here we see at least some of why Christ is called the wisdom of God, because the wisdom of God is shown in his choice for a Savior. God didn't have tryouts for the Savior of humanity. He didn't have a competition for most qualified Savior. He chose Christ, and it was shown to be the right choice. The first choice he made was the right choice, the most fit choice. And God's wisdom is all the more evident in the fact that he has a means for salvation already planned out before the first man even falls. Now, on that note, though, I do remember there was a time when I worked framing houses, and my coworkers they relayed some interesting information to me while I was working with them. They told me what it meant to be a good framer. They told me, being a good framer doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It means you know how to hide your mistakes. <laughs> that was their definition of a good framer. And in that case, I could see their point because if you're, you know, there's a house that's being built and you discover a problem, you can't really just take the whole house down and start over. You gotta work around that problem. That's what they're talking about. You gotta try to make that fit. You gotta make some kind of change. But people can have this kind of idea of God working out salvation, unfortunately. Did God make a huge mess and is merely using Christ to clean it up? Did God make an error and is hiding it or patching it up with Jesus? God hiding his mistake? Not so, brethren. God forbid any say something so horrible as that. Amen. Salvation is not a trial and error kind of project. All right, this idea didn't work. Let's write that off. That idea didn't work out. Let's try that off. Well, people can look at it that way. But that's not the case. We're not talking about men whose wisdom is foolish. We're talking about God. God's wisdom. God's wisdom does not work this way. Not to mention God never made man fall. Man fell by his own hand. God doesn't get any credit for the evils of humanity. God does not make errors, brethren. And I bring this up to show you that Christ was not a spur-of-the-moment kind of choice. You know, like you have those cartoons, the light bulb comes on. I know. Let's send Jesus. That's just not the case. It was not the reaction to a fallout of something God previously did. The whole thing fell apart. we got to rebuild now. Sometimes sports teams do this. Oh, the team's a wreck. Let's rebuild. Let's just throw everyone out, and let's just start constructing something new. That's not what he did. God had salvation planned out. We're going to look further into how this plan has worked out. You see, if God's going to deal with the sins of humanity and save it at the same time, someone's going to have to take the punishment. But it can't just be anyone, though, like a random draw from a basket. And the winner is Jesus. No, that's not how it happened, brethren. The sins of humanity are going to be placed into a fit vessel, a vessel prepared. This means Christ is going to have to become a man and have a body like, you, like we do. His body was a vessel for our sins. But what made it a fit vessel? Christ is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. He's the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And he's the lamb that was offered without blemish and without spot. Christ, though he became a man, knew no sin. Different from men. Jesus was not like other men. He knew no sin. He didn't express sin. He was tempted at all points as we were, but he never committed sin. You know, in Proverbs it says, you know, if he thought of foolishness a sin, well, Jesus didn't even have a foolish thought. Jesus didn't sin. In any way, it is said that he fulfilled the law. He's the only man in the history of the human existence to have ever accomplish such a thing. Like the saying goes, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He has suffered the penalty for, our sin, for your sins in your stead. He bore our sins and it resulted in him being made sin for us. Because of this, he was cursed, forsaken by God, suffering a death far greater than any other man has ever suffered. Now that Christ has been crucified for our sins, God is satisfied, brethren. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. God was able to deal with the sin of man without destroying the world. How amazing is that? 
That shows the wisdom of God. How the heavenly beings must have marveled to see such something like that pulled off. He saved them and he didn't destroy them when they were worthy of death. Amazing thing to consider. God's wisdom was shown in the putting away of sin through the death of Christ. However, there's still more that needs to be done. Now that Christ has died, what will happen now? God's going to raise his son from the dead without sin. Without the sin, your sin on him, he's not going to come back that way. He's going to be highly exalted and given a name above every name. Jesus still plays a role in our salvation, brethren. Despite the penalty of sins being paid, man still needs to be changed. How in the world can God take such a disobedient creature and change him into one that is obedient? How will God make a dead creature living? In Christ, these things are being accomplished through man's connection to him. Now consider at this point what God has intended to save. Now again, this is being observed. This is uh, principalities and powers. They're looking at what God's working with here. This is what God wants to save and reconcile to himself and have fellowship with. This is what he has. It's said that of our past that we were dead in trespasses and sins. That's what God's working with. Children of disobedience, walking according to the course of this world, afar off from God, children of wrath, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, falling short of the glory of God, as sheep gone astray, enemies of God, stony hearts, none doing good. And we know the famous saying, there's none that are righteous, no, not one. God's going to save this? God's going to make this good? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Well, brethren, you're in a room full of proof that this was not too hard a task for the Lord to accomplish. Throughout the rest of our time in this world, we are being changed and conformed to the image of his son. Rather than fulfilling ungodly lusts, God is going to have a people that deny ungodly lusts. How about that for a change? Rather than people who live for themselves, God's going to have a people that don't live for themselves, but, the one who, but to the one who died for them. That's what God's going to have. Rather than being a people that are defiled, wicked, and condemned, God's going to have a people that are washed, sanctified, and glorified. Rather than being a people who are lovers of their own selves and lovers of pleasure, God's going to have a people with a new heart and new spirit who love him and don't find his commandments grievous. They will look for a new heavens and a new earth and await the Son of God's return. And none of this will come by force. There's another thing to consider here. God will not have to force a single one of these fallen creatures into heaven. No one's going into heaven kicking and screaming. They're going to admit they're sinful. And they're going to willingly come and repent from their transgression and submit themselves to the work of God. This fallen creature here, these children of disobedience, are going to come forth and submit themselves to the Lord. They're going to request change. They're going to say, I don't want to be this anymore. I don't want to be that anymore, Lord. I want to be in fellowship with you. These fallen creatures are going to do that through Christ Jesus. But how will that happen? It happens through the Holy Ghost who convicts all men of their sin. Our God is wise indeed, always having a means to carry out his will. This sanctification takes place through connection to Christ who died for our sins and was raised from the dead. God is going to aid men in righteousness by means of resources, which will only be made available in Christ Jesus. The resources, the resources are all the more needful because while going through the process of change, the people of God have an adversary seeking to take them down. Okay, there's another complicating factor. God wants to change them. They're, they're wayward. They're rebellious. He's going to make them obedient. He's going to make them where they love him over their own selves. But now they have, we have this enemy to deal with too. Someone's, there's an opposition of some kind. Someone's trying to overthrow. Someone's trying to pull them off the track. The devil seeking whom he may devour. The devil which tempted even the garden. He's seeking to bring down all of God's people. Roaring lion. However, brother, knowing of his enemy, God has provided his people with divine armor and the ability to resist the devil so that they're not overcome. God has, been, God has not been like thrown off guard here. He knows how to keep his people from being overcome by the devil. You see, these, pe these people that were previously selfish, rebellious, sinful, and wayward, they're not only changing into righteous, holy, blameless, and obedient people, they're also becoming fighters. Remember, David, teach my fingers to fight. Give me victory. And he did give David victory. We know that. He gives us victory too. 
Give us armor, shield, sword, a helmet, breastplate, gospel of peace. We have a means to fight. The overcome are becoming overcomers. In the end, they will stand before God as people that stood strong through all manner of adversity and tribulation. It will be said of these people, I speak of us, of course, the devil couldn't bring them down. He tried, he tried, but they remained faithful all the way to the end. Sorry, devil, you failed. Do you know, don't you desire that to be said of you? Abide in the sun and it will be said of you. You will be victorious in the end. You will stand with the Lord approved and welcome in his presence. So brethren, having said this, do not be troubled by the trials of this life. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Look at what he's accomplished thus far in salvation and all of his wisdom. Can the Lord in all his wisdom not make a way of escape for you when you're tempted? Can the Lord in all of his wisdom not keep you from falling? Can the Lord in all his wisdom not ground you, settle you, where no opposing force can blow you over or remove you from his hand? Is this too hard for the Lord? I say, not so. So that I can exhort you, trust in the Lord. All these things, are, of course, that are happening in us right now are being observed by higher powers in heaven. They're seeing, they're seeing you hate the sin you once loved. They're taking note of that. They are seeing you leave the world you once lived at home with, lived at home at, and heading toward the Lord. Repentance, you've made a change of direction. They see that. Amen. They're learning from that. They see you believing the Lord, living for him. They see you standing in the midst of adversity. Hey, Brother Given's still here. He hasn't fallen off. He survived. Brother Justin survived that attack. He's still believing. You see, the angels rejoice when somebody's saved. They rejoice in this too. This is good to see. And all these things being worked out in you, it's the manifold wisdom of God that's being made known to heavenly beings. They are seeing things that seemed impossible being made possible. So I ask then, are you aware that these beings are watching these meetings? Are they, not, are, are they seeing God's wisdom when you meet together, whether it be here or in your assemblies at home? Is that what they're seeing? I assure you, if you're submitting to the work of God, and giving your whole self to him, they are going to see his wisdom. Amen. Woe to any who bring a reproach to the name of the Lord on this matter. God has determined results, and he's going to get them, brethren. Amen. Do not look. Do you look at the church today and see God's name being exalted? I do not. Not commonly, anyway. His name may not be lifted up in the carnal and lifeless churches of our time, but it is being lifted up among the remnant. That is where angels are gathering, desiring to look into the gospel, and that is where principalities and powers in high places are seeing the wisdom of God worked out, where God's working, Amen. in the real people. Some good things we can hear gather from this is that God can make us wise as well. Well, like some brother had said, brother, you don't have to be stupid. Well, brother, God's people are like him. As God is wise, we are partakers of wisdom as well. Wisdom from above, not wise with earthly wisdom. You can be made wise into salvation. Like it says, if any man lacks wisdom, God can give it to you. Amen. You may start off in this world being foolish and unlearned, but that changes when you come into Christ. God's people are like him. They are wise. So I exhort you to put your trust in the wise God and know the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise into salvation and to walk in wisdom. So I say, God be praised for his great wisdom, which we can see in the gospel of Christ.